Bună seara, doamnelor și domnilor! Vă spunem un bun venit la conferința Edictum Day. Numele meu este George Găvruș. În numele echipei de organizare, vă mulțumesc că sunteți prezenți la Ateneu în această frumoasă seară de vară. Aceasta este prima noastră conferință la București, după șapte ani în care am făcut conferințe și evenimente la Cluj. Cine suntem? Ce ne propunem? Edictum de este o organizație studențească formată dintr-un grup de inimoși, cum ne numea domnul Andrei Pleșu, care pe lângă joburile noastre ne facem timp să organizăm evenimente la care promovăm în universitate și în spațiu public valorile morale ce își au sorgintea în învățătura iudeo-creștină. Încercăm să generăm un spațiu de dialog și de discuție despre Dumnezeu și despre valori creștine. Societatea noastră românească este încă profund marcată de cei 45 de ani de ideologia T, peste care se adaugă curentele laiciste, relativiste, pragmatiste. Ne integrăm în spațiul european, spațiul care eșuează să recunoască rolul fundamental ce l-a jucat creștinismul și valorile sale în construcția Europei. Într-o notă mai personală, mi-am petrecut 9 ani de, de zile din viață în Asia Centrală, în Afganistan. Spre deosebire de toate țările din prejur, Afganistanul nu a fost niciodată colonizat. Mai mult, până prin anii 40 a fost o țară interzisă străinilor. În secolul XIX a fost folosită ca și stat tampon între Imperiul Țarist la nord și Imperiul Britanic la vest. În ceea ce s-a numit atunci The Great Game, care era jocul diplomatic și militar dintre, pentru controlarea Asiei Centrale. Astfel, astăzi, Afganistanul este o țară ce în ultimul mileniu nu a fost influențată deloc de valori creștine. La afgani există o lege nescrisă, care e mai importantă decât legea scrisă, evident, legea răzbunării. Dacă nu te răzbuni, îți pierzi onoarea și rolul și locul în societate. Această filozofie alimentează acest ciclu al violenței de care am auzit și din care, care din păcate, ne-a afectat chiar și pe noi, românii, 27 de militari români, dacă nu greșesc, și-au pierdut viața în Afganistan, sute de răniți. Iertarea dușmanului, iubirea apropiului, toleranța, nu au pătruns niciodată în etosul poporului afgan. Pe când tocmai aceste valori au condus la progresul din lumea vestică de care ne bucurăm și noi astăzi. Întrebarea fundamentală la care încercăm să răspundem este poate Europa să se îndepărteze de Dumnezeu, de valorile creștine, care au stat la baza civilizației ei și să supraviețuiască. Invitatul serii, după cum știți, este domnul Denis Preger, care ne va fi prezentat în momentele următoare de către domnul Teodor Baconski, căruia îi mulțumim călduros pentru prezența sa. În a doua parte a conferinței vom avea un dialog între domnul Denis Preger și prietenul organizației Edictum Day, domnul profesor Adrian Papahaci. Apoi vom continua cu o serie de Q&A, de întrebări și răspunsuri, moderată tot de către domnul Adrian Papahagi. La final, vom avea o sesiune de semnare a cărții domnului Preger, recent publicată de către editura 
Succeed Publishing, reprezentată de domnul Vasilică Croitor aici de față. Și acum vă doresc o seară cât mai uh, inspirantă uh, și am onoarea de a-l invita la microfon pe domnul Teodor Paconschi. Bună seara, doamnelor și domnilor! Iată-mă în rolul unui vorbitor tampon, asemenea Afganistanului, în geopolitica secolului XIX. Am acceptat cu mare bucurie onoarea de a-l introduce în această seară la tenorul român, pe domnul Denis Prager, pe care mulți dintre noi îl cunosc, fie din lectura cărților sale, fie din foarte cunoscutele mini-eseuri video postate pe YouTube sub genericul Prager University. Domnul Prager se află în România pentru prima dată și va susține o conferință aici, în această seară, urmată de o a doua conferință la Cluj, cartierul general al uh, Edictum Dei. Trebuie să îmi fac datoria, fără să mă substitui unei pagini de Wikipedia, de a vă prezenta câteva date uh, biografice legate de oaspetele nostru și câteva scurte reflexii despre semnificația prezenței sale printre noi astăzi. Domnul Prege s-a născut la New York la 2 august 1948, într-o familie de evrei moderați, și și-a desăvârșit educația formală în două centre de excelență, la Columbia University și la University of Leeds. Imediat după absolvire, a devenit un autor sau coautor de bestselleruri focalizate pe o tematică, bineînțeles, inspirată de propriile rădăcini familiale, și anume de uh, istoria Orientului Mijlociu, de problema antisemitismului și de ceea ce s-ar putea numi civilizația de calocului. Uh, această activitate autorială a fost uh, strălucit amplificată prin uh, aceea de media man, de om care a pus pe picioare niște talk show-uri radiofonice cu o audiență din ce în ce mai vastă <coughs> și care au dovedit că mesajul pe care îl transmite domnul Preger își găsește un ecou imediat printre contemporanii noștri lucizi într-o lume tot mai uh, sever tulburată de relativism etic, de spiritul de construcției, de nihilism, de agnosticism antiștiințific, pentru că putem respecta un agnosticism științific. Pe scurt, de o întreagă, un întreg decor de ideologii care se ciognesc, care ne întunecă privirea, care ne tulbură mințile, care sabotează minimum de armonie socială și de dialog, fără de care nicio civilizație nu poate subzista. Așa încât, cred că această carismă a argumentului calm, specifică domnului Prager, capacitatea sa de a livra idei mari în forme simple, imediat accesibile, trebuie salutată, trebuie încurajată, trebuie urmată pentru că suntem într-o lume în care sofisticarea intelectuală devine paravanul unor exerciții de admirație a vidului spiritual, a lipsei de sens istoric, a deconcertării civilizaționale și cred că avem nevoie, în contrapondere, tocmai de figuri de acest tip, care nu sunt figuri predictibil didactice, predicatoriale, soporifice, ci figuri de oameni vii, 
care înțeleg că nu suntem prima generație de oameni inteligenți, care înțeleg că nu e cazul să arunci ceva bun din trecut dacă acel ceva și-a dovedit utilitatea, valoarea morală, forța de a inspira acțiunea pentru binele comun. Și cred că toate aceste trăsături ale personalității domnului Preger ne-au adunat aici, le vor permite și compatrioților noștri să-l cunoască mai bine, să se apropie dezinhibat de acest orizont, să zicem, doctrinar, conservator, bine înrădăcinat în inteligență critică și totodată în valorile fondatoare ale civilizației iudeocreștine. Cred că nu e cazul să mă extind mai mult de atât, toată lumea îl așteaptă pe protagonistul acestei seri, așa că let Let us enjoy the conference presented by our most celebrated guest tonight. And the conference will be followed by uh, an extremely exciting intellectual dialogue between our guest and Mr. Papa Haji. O seara bună tuturor! Merci. <laughs> Mr. Foreign Minister, thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish I spoke Romanian. It's painful because I want to be as clear as possible, and obviously it would be clearer to you in your own language. But I've studied many languages, but unfortunately Romanian is not one of them. I only know really two words in Romanian, other than merci, and that the reason for these two words is that I was here in Romania before most of you were born. I was here 40 years ago. When I was in my 20s, I came here because I was a student of communism and communist countries. I studied Russian and the Soviet Union and East Europe. Those were my specialties. I was at Columbia University at the Russian Institute, and I came uh, to East Europe year after year. I hated communism, and I wanted to be able to see it firsthand. And so the only two words I learned in my two trips to Romania were Trajaska Partidul. <laughs> Yes, this man went like this. I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. And uh, it was, uh, it, it was it true in every communist country. That's all you would see is hail to the party, and whether it's you know, Russian or Hungarian or Bulgarian or Polish, and it was all nonsense and it was all evil, and I knew it, and. The sad, there were many sad aspects to all of that. One of the saddest is that when I would go back to America and start lecturing about life in communist countries, Americans totally understandably, but sadly, did not understand totalitarianism. Did, it, it was a word, it, it didn't mean anything. Do you know that when I gave my, a thesis at Columbia, and I gave it orally, my professor, and I'll tell you who it was, is Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was the head, that he was then teaching at Columbia University, and then became the head of national security for President Jimmy Carter. And I remember using the word totalitarianism in my thesis. And he said, excuse me, Mr. Prager, but we don't use that word here. We're not sure what it means. Which is amazing since Brzezinski came from Poland. He didn't know what it meant. And it was, it was part of what I realized was going on at our universities, the moral confusion 
at our universities, which I will come to, there is a very interesting, if, I'm, if I may say that about something I wrote, a very interesting piece I wrote many years ago, How I Found God at Columbia. And I will come to that in a moment. What I want to speak to you about tonight, because there were so many things I, I would so love to speak to you about, but happily, if you enjoy tonight, there's much more on the internet. Uh, it is, there's a lot of Prager stuff. By the way, how many of you have seen a PragerU video? Wow, I've, <laughs> that's, that's really wonderful. That's, my, that's really my dream. By the way, I, I just need you to know, it was not my idea. Uh, I, my name is on it, but it was not my idea. And the man whose idea it was is here with me from the United States, Alan Estrin. Would you please stand wherever you, Alan, wherever, there he is. So I want to speak to you about the most radical experiment in human history is taking place right now in Western Europe, somewhat in Eastern Europe, and in the United States, Canada, Australia, and the Western world. In the history of mankind, we have no example, not one, of a godless society. This is totally new to try to create a society without God. Now, even before the God of the Bible, everybody believed in gods, so there was no example, there is no example. Western Europe and somewhat America and Australia, Canada, as I said, they are trying something radically new in human history. Create a society with nothing higher than man. It will fail. We are built to have something higher than us. We need something higher than us. And so what is happening is a farce. Western Europe and America and the West generally are creating a farce, a moral and intellectual fraud. And it can best be seen at the university the universities are the most godless place in the Western world. And that's why I wrote my column years ago, how, uh, how I Found God at Columbia, and this is what happened. When I was a graduate student at Columbia, I, I felt I was going crazy because I was learning nonsense, just nonsense. Professor after professor was telling me there was no difference between men and women. That it was all socially constructed. There's no built-in difference. Today it's worse. Today not only are we taught, our kids taught at college and high school and elementary school that there is no difference between men and women. They are taught that there's no such thing as men and women. If you sign up for Facebook in America, for gender, you have 56 choices. Is that clear? I mean, I want to make sure that was clear. Under gender, sex, it is now 50, you could be 56 things. No, you can't. You could be one of two things, male or female. I was learning that nonsense. I was learning that the United States and the Soviet Union were equally responsible for the Cold War that Stalin and Truman were moral equals. And this is, this is what my, my field of study was, communist affairs, the School of International Affairs at Columbia. So I was being taught by very intelligent men and women nonsense. And it drove me crazy. How could such bright people believe such stupid things? And then walking through the campus at Columbia, all of a sudden, a phrase, a verse from the Bible came into my brain. I was raised in Jewish schools. I am a Jew. I am a religious Jew. I was raised in, in yeshiva. Yeshiva is half the day 
religious studies in Hebrew and half the day secular studies in English. So it was a very intense education. And I, uh, I was taught the Bible in Hebrew and all of a sudden, for the first time since I was a child, a verse came into my mind from the Bible and it was, it came into my brain in Hebrew, Reshit Chochma Yirat Adonai, the wisdom begins with fear of God. And this was a revelation to me because I realized, oh, I now know why there's no wisdom at Columbia. Because there's no God at Columbia. That has been a truism in my life. There are brilliant secular people. There are kind secular people. There are stupid religious people. There are mean religious people. But there is no secular wisdom. That's what I came to realize. The godless world is a wisdomless world. There is nothing to be learned about life. There are facts to be learned. There is physics and algebra and law. There are many things to be learned at a secular university, but there is no wisdom. It is the opposite of wisdom. To tell people that there is no difference between America and the Soviet Union, that there is no difference between men and women, is to be completely free of wisdom. And that is what has happened. And that is what is happening in the Western world generally. The United Nations is a perfect example. The United States just now, thank God, decided it was leaving the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council is Orwellian. I'm sure Orwell is in Romania. Orwell was a prophet. Orwell, this is Orwellian. The United Nations Human Rights Council is anti-human rights. It's a farce. You know who is condemned the most in the UN Human Rights Council? Every week, Israel one of the most decent countries in the world, threatened with annihilation, extinction, and genocide, that's the country condemned. Not North Korea, not Syria, not Iran, Israel. So America, under this president, who was called a Nazi by the left because they have lost their wisdom and their moral ability to discern good from evil, decided finally, we have had enough we are leaving the Human Rights Council. This is an upside down world, upside down. Israel is evil, its enemies are good. America is evil, its enemies are good. It's, it's upside down, but if it's repeated enough, well, you know the rest, it's believed. So I wanna give you a list of things that happen when we get rid of God in the West. This is not the whole list, but it's a big list. Number one, uh, uh, Chesterton, G.K. Chesterton is quoted as saying, he didn't exactly say this, but he's the one that it's attributed to. When people stop believing in God, they do not believe in nothing, they believe in anything. That's exactly what has happened. Christianity, with all its moral issues in the Middle Ages and later, and I fully acknowledge that, nevertheless, when Christianity died in Europe, we did not get beauty. We did not get kindness. We got communism and Nazism. Do you know, I have been doing a radio show in America for 33 years. One of the most common things people call to disagree with me about is this. They will say, Dennis, I don't understand why you promote religion. More people have been killed in the name of God and religion than anything else. Well, I always realize they must have gone to college. There's no other explanation for such a stupid comment. More people were killed in the 20th century in the name of humanity, not God, than in any other century in history, there's no close second. 
communism and Nazism were the most barbaric doctrines in history. They were secular. They were not religious. They were secular religions, but they were not religious. They hated religion. I remember, because I studied Russian, I, I remember oh, all the societies and museums that Stalin created and Lenin created when they came to power. Bezboznik means without God. It's the fancy word in, in, in Russian for, uh, for atheist. That's, that's what they, they, they hated religion, any religion. When people stop believing in God, things don't get good. Things get bad. Now, you know how often, if you look on the internet, it is so often, Prager said you can't be a good person if you're an atheist. I have never said that in my life. Not only have I never said it, I don't believe it. Of course there are kind people who are atheists. The issue, there are kind people who believed in Zeus. There were kind people who believed in Apollo. There were kind people who believed in all sorts of gods. So what? There were kind people all over the place and bad people all over the place. The question is not one individual, one individual. The question is society. Will we create a good society where everybody gets to choose what is good and evil? Which brings me to number two, good and evil. If there is no God who says, do not murder, murder is not wrong. It is unbelievable. Every atheist philosopher I know understands this, but the average American or European does not. They can't understand if there is no God who says, do not murder, murder is not wrong, it's all opinion. I think murder is wrong, you think it's right. Do you know the last group in Europe to be converted by the Catholic Church? The Germanic tribes. And you know why? The church said, hey, you gotta live by the Ten Commandments. And the German tribe said, what's in it? <laughs> they said, well, do not murder, forget it. It's not for us. This notion, see, you don't, you don't, you don't know people <laughs> on my radio show, when somebody says something particularly stupid, do you know what I say? Say, I never ever have, I've never once insulted a caller in 33 years. I am very polite to all callers. But I do say the following, if they say something very stupid, I say, I'm just curious, what college did you go to? <laughs> And then they will say, why do you ask? And I said, because you had to go to college to say something that stupid. <laughs> if you didn't go to college, you would never say that. And I'm not insulting you, I'm insulting college. And I, want, and I, I make that clear, I'm not insulting you. You had to learn that. People will say, oh, you don't need a God to say murder is wrong. Everybody can figure it out. Really? How? Well, I don't want to be murdered, so I won't murder. But that's absurd. No Nazi wanted to be murdered. They just wanted to murder. Stalin didn't want to be murdered. That's why he had somebody taste his food every day. He was afraid of being murdered. But he didn't mind murdering 40 million Soviet citizens. He didn't mind having a, 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 a genocide famine in the Ukraine. Didn't mean anything to Stalin. This notion, I think it's wrong, therefore I won't do it, that is, that's absurd. Prisons are filled with people who murder, who don't want to be murdered. Yes, we do need a God to tell us what is right and what is wrong. And I will give you an example, because again, I made a PragerU video exactly on the subject. If there is no God, murder is not wrong. So people, they very, get very angry and they get mockery. Oh, Prager, he would be killing if it weren't for God. He is a very scary man. So here is an example. I'm sure I wouldn't be murdering if tomorrow I woke up an atheist. I agree, I would not go around murdering. But how about this? This is more realistic. And I write about this in my latest book, The Rational Bible. 
the beginning of my commentary on the first five books of the Bible. When I was in my late teens and my early 20s, I had emotional issues with my parents. <laughs> Who doesn't? Okay, most people do. Not my kids, but, my, <laughs> but I did. Yeah, right, exactly. And uh, I, so I, uh, but I remember this. Because I believe that God gave the Ten Commandments, and one of them is honor your father and mother, I always honored my father and mother. No matter how emotionally ambivalent I felt, I honored my mother and father. I left my parents' house at the age of 21. There was not a week that I did not call my parents. Anywhere I was in America, anywhere I was in the world, I called my parents every single week. I did so because God said, honor your father and mother. That's why I did it. Later in life, I did it simply because I knew how good it made my parents feel and that was worth it. But in the beginning, I only did it because I believe there is a God who said, honor your father and mother. I don't think this is what I am about to say is a problem in Romania, but it is a big problem in America. And I learned about it because of my radio show. After all, I talk to millions of people and many call in every single day. In America, there are many, many adults who do not speak to their parents. This is an, a, a national epidemic in the United States. They're angry at their parents and they have cut off all communication. I have had parents call my show and start to cry on the radio because their son or daughter has not spoken to them in five years, 10 years. I have had parents call me to tell me their child does not let them see their grandchildren because they're angry at them. I would love, love to make the following study. I would like to have a study of all adults who are angry at their parents in America and all those who don't speak to their parent, how many of them are religious and how many of them are secular. I would, I would like to, I would like to, I don't know the answer of the study, but I would like to make that study. If you think God tells you to act in a certain way, that's a big deal. The arrogance and foolishness of secular people to think we don't need God to make people better. God can make people worse. I know that. There are people who used God to defend evil. I know that. I, I, it's a tragedy, it is terrible. But you can't get real good with no God. People drive more safely when the police are present on the road. Is that correct? Why? Why don't people drive properly without the police? Because there's a consequence when the police are around. There's a consequence if there is a God around. There are no consequences if there's no God around. So, number one, false, the, 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 number one was the false religions that come after the death of God religions. Marxism and, and, uh, and, uh, co and, and uh, communism and Nazism and so on. Number two, the death of good and evil as absolutes. Everything is now opinion. How I feel, how I feel, how I feel. Number three, the death of meaning. Meaning, if there is no God, there is no ultimate meaning to life. Life is really, to be honest, one big joke. It's all coincidence. You have no ultimate meaning. I have no ultimate meaning. You are like a rock on Jupiter. On Mars, there's no difference. The only difference between you and a, and a rock on Mars is you think you're important 
The rock on Mars does not think it's important. That's the only difference. We fool ourselves. Life is a bad joke for most people. For some of us, it's a good joke. I, for me, it's a good joke. I've had a good life. With the usual amount of pain, but I've had a good life. But for most people, it's been a very hard life. Without God, sorry. That's the way it goes. As we say in America, that is the way the cookie crumbles. I wish I knew how to say that in Romanian. I'll learn it though. I'll, that and Trajaska Partidu will be my, my, uh, my Romanian. No meaning. And by the way, I see it in America and the West, I see it. Do you know what the biggest problem in some ways is with the next generation in Western Europe and America? They're bored. Not bored that they don't have anything to do. They, they have this to do, right? They have the internet, they have videos, they're, they're filled with things to do. But they have, the best word is not bored, the best word is in French, ennui. There is a boredom of the soul because there's no purpose, there's no ultimate purpose. And boredom produces very bad results. Do you know, I have been to every European country except Slovakia and Macedonia. I've been to 130 countries. I've traveled a lot. Do you know what is amazing? Every European country all over is graffiti. All over. This was not true in a more religious Europe. And for, for Europeans, it doesn't even matter. It's street art. It's not street art, it's vandalism. Uh, by the way, the proof, it's, there's a very simple proof it's not street art. Ask anyone who says it's street art, can we do it on your house? <laughs> right? Who doesn't want art? Free! You will have free art. You don't even have to pay them. They're lying when they call it street art. They're lying because they don't want it on their house. This is, who does that? They're bored. They have no meaning. This is my way of saying I'm important. I have put up my initials. I have put up a word, a symbol on public walls. That's all it is. Or worse, I would like to bring down society. Boredom emanates from secularism. People don't have meaning. And it's scary where they will find meaning. Number four, without God, art becomes a farce. <laughs> I have, I, in one of my books, I list art museum after art museum, which has an exhibit of poop, urine, vomit, menstrual blood. The, the art, art, the left in the arts loves that stuff. Now, by the way, I looked up poop in an English-Romanian dictionary because I, I didn't know if you would know what poop is. But I can't say the bad word, so it said caca. <laughs> is that correct? Is that a bad word? It's somewhat bad. Is there a worse word? Okay, thank God, thank God, okay, fine. I don't want to be gross, but I, that's what I got when I looked it up on Google. So you have to, I'll give you example after, so the most recent is in Holland, at a very big museum in Holland. Now you have to understand, this received a serious review in the arts section of the New York Times. This is taken seriously. There, you enter, it is a, a gigantic, the biggest room of the museum, bigger than this room, and gigantic poop. Sculptures of poop. That's called art. Does the word scatological mean anything? That's what it is all today, scatological art. The Museum of Modern Art in Orange County, California, where I live in California, has a giant 
giant, uh, I would say 10 meters high uh, dog, sculpted dog, and it is always peeing, urinating in, on the front wall of the museum, a yellow stream. That is in front of the Museum of Art in Orange County, California. The Guggenheim Museum, one of the most prestigious museums in the world, New York City, just had an exhibit for a year, a pure gold toilet bowl that worked. A working toilet, pure gold by an Italian artist. And you could go in and you pay money and you could poop or pee. And do you know what the name of the exhibit was? America. <laughs> so you could go to the Guggenheim and you can pee or poop on America. This is the, this is the world of the arts today. I can give you example after example. Piss Christ, have you ever heard of that one? Where the artist's cru a urine and a crucifix is inside. It's called Piss Christ. It's gone from museum to museum in America. I'll tell you this, there would be no Piss Quran in America. <laughs> Among other things, the left are cowards. They pick on Christianity because nobody's going to hurt them. They're frauds. The whole world, it is, it is, a, it is a fraudulent world. This is the post religious, post-Judeo-Christian world that the left has produced in the arts. There is no such thing as the beautiful, the uplifting. Michelangelo or poop, you choose. Number five, wisdom. I already told you about wisdom, so we, that I can move on. Number six, no God, no ultimate justice. Hitler, and his victims have the same fate, right? There is no ultimate justice. The torturer and the tortured have the same fate. What a universe. I, you know, here's a question I want you to ask any atheist you know. This is the only question I now ask them, because then I know if they are intellectually honest. I ask one question. Do you hope you are right? or wrong. If they hope they're wrong, they're intellectually honest. That's an honest atheist. If they hope they're right, there's something wrong with the way they think. You hope you're right? You hope that the torture, the rapist and the, and the raped have the same fate? You hope that Hitler and Mother Teresa have the same fates? Are you sick? Something's wrong with your conscience, something wrong is with your mind, and something wrong is with your heart. That's a world where there is no God, though. There is no ultimate justice. If you've lived a life and hurt people your whole life, or blessed people your whole life, it's the same fate. Nothing. Number six, therefore, there is no optimism in the secular world. We all just die, and if that's the end, and that's the way it is, bye-bye. I mean, I, I, one of the leading atheists in the United States, I had a debate, I've debated all of them, except for the guy in England. But I've debated all the atheists, and, I, and I, this guy, Michael Shermer, who's the editor of Skeptic Magazine, he's an honest atheist. So on, on this video cast, I asked him, do you hope you're right or wrong? So he didn't want to answer it, but to his credit, he answered. He said, look, would I like to be able to see my children after I die? Would I like to be reunited with my parents? Of course. So I said, fine, okay, yes. That's only available if there is a God. Otherwise, it's all over. Bye-bye, bye-bye, everybody. I don't, now you may say it's wishful thinking. I don't know for a fact there's an afterlife. I only know this fact. If there is a God, and if God is good, there is an afterlife. Now, I don't believe it is a leap of faith to believe there is a God. To believe there is a God is pure reason.
To believe God is good, that is a leap of faith because there really is so much evil in the world and so much suffering. So I admit that, I admit. But it doesn't mean that because I wish that there is ultimate justice, therefore it's false. I wish a lot of things. It doesn't make it false, <laughs> right? It doesn't make it false, it doesn't make it true. But if there is a decent God, a good God, a just God, there is an afterlife. That is only available if there is a God. What am I up to? Seven, eight, what am I, whatever I'm up to. Interestingly, we religious people are more rational than the secular. We religious people in the West really do believe that there is a difference between men and women. They don't. Who is more rational? Just on that alone, do they not lose all their credibility? It's very interesting. I did debate a very famous American atheist on my radio show. To his credit, he acknowledged that radical Islam is a big threat to the world. Most atheists and, and, and any leftist, they don't acknowledge that. And I said to him, I said, so let me ask you a question. Why is it that the only groups, not individuals, groups, that agree that there is a great threat of radical Islam to the West and to the world are almost all religious Christians? And he said, you're right. My only allies tend to be religious Christians. Maybe they think more clearly, I said to him. Maybe the religious do think more clearly. And that is what I have found in my life. I'm not talking about theology. I don't care, I do care about theology, but that, I, never, I never judge theology. I judge reality. Reality is what matters. Who produces more reasonable attitudes towards life? Who produces better kids? Who produces kids who think that God wants them to honor their parents? Just to give that example. Rational? Was Marxism rational? One of the dumbest ideas in history. Karl Marx was a dummy. He was a brilliant... He was a brilliant dummy. Why did you applaud? Do you know very few American audiences would applaud? You applaud because you lived through it. You lived the consequences of people believing idiocy. Still do. <laughs> yes. That is why the only Latino, Hispanic, conservative community in America are the Latin Americans who came from Cuba. I always say, those who know evil are conservative. Those who don't know evil are on the left. Because the left is naive. You understand, you live, the, the, the lie, the gigantic lies of, of Marxism, I mean, it was astonishing. You know, let everybody be equal. Let everybody be equal means let's have totalitarianism. That's what it means. There is no other way to have everyone equal. As I tell Americans, it's not fair, I agree, baseball players make much, much more money than teachers. It's not fair, but thank God they do. It means it's a free country. Only in a totalitarian state will a baseball player and a teacher make the same amount of money. But that's all they talk about, equal, equal, equal. Let everybody end up the same. They, did, they do polls in America now, more and more. The majority of, of, of the members of the Democratic Party in the United States think that it would be a good thing if there were no rich people in America. <laughs> you had to go to college to believe something that stupid. <laughs> you know who pay almost all the taxes in America? Rich people. You know who build the hospitals? Rich people. You know who build the museums? Rich people. 
What are they talking? They don't know what they're talking about. They don't. They live in a world of theory. So yes, without God, you end up irrational. They say we're irrational. They are irrational. Next, if there is no God, there is no free will. If there is no God, there is no soul. All we are is matter, right? Materialism, you know about materialism, Marxist materialism. This, the only reality is matter. Therefore, you and I are just matter. Why do we do anything? For two reasons, environment and genes. That's it, there's no free will. We are artificial intelligence, that's all we are. But if you believe in God, that's not all we are. There is, some, there is a mind that is not physical. There is a conscience that is not physical. There is a soul that is not physical. That is what gives you free will. If there is no God, I am only genes and only environment. I am not responsible for what I do. And that is what is believed in Western Europe. In Norway, the most you can get for murder is, I, I believe, seven years in prison. Because they don't believe murderers are really responsible for what they did. Norway is to blame if you commit murder in Norway. That's the thing in America. Society is to blame, not the criminal. Next, no God, no inalienable human rights. Where do human rights come from? Genes, chromosomes, the, the founding document of the United States of America, the Declaration of Independence says, we have certain inalienable rights, rights that cannot be taken away from us. And there's only one reason, because they come from God, from our creator. No creator, no rights. It's pretty simple. These are the consequences of the, the death of God. There are just a few of them. On any one of these, I could give an entire speech. But we have to know them. When I argue about God with callers who are atheists or agnostics, I don't make the arguments from creation, which are very powerful. I believe in them. I make the arguments of this. Do you understand the consequences of the death of God? That alone should make you very, very worried about the death of God in the West. The boredom, the, the moral anarchy, and what, what is happening. Do you know that in the United States today, I'm sure you don't know this, there would be no reason you would, Teachers of little children, I'm talking about five, six-year-old children. Teachers in America are told, do not call your students boys and girls. Just call them students, because we do not want to impose a gender identity on children. I consider that a form of child abuse. Not to call boys and girls boys and girls. Do you know that uh, there was, it was on my radio show, which by the way, you're, you can hear here anytime on the internet, just as I broadcast it, it's very easy to hear. And anyway, it's, it's three hours every day. And I, I reported last week in Connecticut, the state of Connecticut, uh, at a high school, there, was, uh, there were uh, races, girls against girls, and the winners of the races were boys who said they were girls. I understand you're laughing, but it's not funny. And anyone who said, you know, I don't mind calling them girls. If they say they're girls, fine. I, and I, I don't either. If you say you're a girl, okay, have a great day. I will honor you, not a problem. But I don't want you, if you have a male body, to race against girls with female bodies. That's just not fair. They keep winning the races. But if you say anything about it, you are called a bigot. This is what we have come to. Boys' bodies. There was, uh, we have a video on this subject about, about this uh, happening. 
And a, uh, in mixed martial arts, you know that the fighting that they do in the ring, you can kick and you can do anything, basically. So uh, the, a very strong woman was up against a woman who had been a man. And he gave her a concussion. She went to the hospital. The woman said, I had never felt such strength in my life because she wasn't fighting a woman. She was fighting a man. <coughs> and this is what goes for uh, intellectual life and secular life in the United States today. I am a Jew, most of you are Christian. We have to work together to save the West. There is, no, there is no other possible solution. We have, we, we are basically have the same Bible, same God, same Ten Commandments. That's why I always explain to people the use of the term Judeo-Christian values. Of course there's no Judeo-Christian theology, but there's no Christian theology. There's, there's Protestant theology and Evangelical theology and Catholic theology and Orthodox theology. And th that's not my business theology. My business is values. And we get, we get it from this God who tells us, love your neighbor as yourself. But I will admit to you, my favorite verse in the Bible is not love your neighbor as yourself. I admit it. It maybe won't sound bad, but I will tell you my favorite verse. I'll even tell it to you in Hebrew, so you'll know it's the real deal. Ohave Adonai sin ura. Those of you who love God hate evil. If you don't... If you don't hate evil, you don't love God. God is good, so God hates evil. I'm not telling you to hate every person who sins. We all sin. But, but every sin is not evil. Every sin is a sin. You've got to do a lot to be evil. It's an achievement. <laughs> this is why we have to teach our fellow citizens before it's too late. And we lose the best chance for a better world called Western civilization. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Merci. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Îl invităm acum pe domnul profesor Adrian Papahaci și până ocupă locuri. Dânsii s-au întâlnit astăzi pentru prima dată și discutând despre această conferință, domnul Denis Preger i-a spus nu vreau să știu nimic din ce ai pregătit, nu vreau să știu întrebările, întreabă-mă orice dorești. Haideți să-i ascultăm. All right, well, thank you, first of all, uh, Dennis Prager, for agreeing to end this evening with its anticlimax. I'm very glad to be here. You have certainly proved and persuaded us that you are a religious man, because you were certainly not bored and certainly did not bore us to death. On the contrary. <laughs> thank you, so thank you. There was no ennui I spotted in the entire room, and you also proved one further very important point as your, uh, I certainly uh, model William Buckley Jr. said that uh, modern formulations are necessary even in defense of very ancient truth. And what you have shown us is that we need to formulate the defense of ancient wisdom and ancient truth in the face of modern folly. Uh, you have also shown us what happens when eschatology ends up becoming scatology. And you have also shown us, on a less merry note, what happens when you take God away. 
And since I teach Shakespeare as well, I cannot refrain from the pleasure of quoting him before I start actually asking you. In Troilus and Cressida, Ulysses has a very famous speech about degree. And by Shakespearean degree, we must understand hierarchy, order, meaning, sense. This is what Ulysses says. Take but degree away, untune that string, and hark what discord follows. Each thing meets in mere a pugnancy. Now, a pugnancy is a difficult word. I'm sure you understand it. Namely, everything falls to pieces, everything uh, is in conflict. And this is what our modern world shows us. It started with deicide. God is dead, they said. Of course, then they kept dying themselves, but God, they said, they, God is dead, they proclaimed. Then they wanted to kill the kings and all principle of order. After the kings, of course, it came uh, to the fathers. They had to destroy the order of family, the order of family. So from deicide to regicide to parricide and ultimately to come to your title to suicide. This is the path that modernity has taken indeed, and you have been too persuasive for me to have to repeat your conference uh, this evening. So now, apart from your unholy decalogue of evil things modernity has done to civilization, uh, I have made a list myself, and I would like to uh, move on to ask you about the things that you didn't have on your list or didn't develop perhaps well enough. And in the end, I will ask you to discuss the differences between the West and not the rest, but the East of the West, Eastern Europe. Does Eastern Europe stand more of a chance than Western Europe? But before we get there, uh, the first question is, why is God hated? Why is God hated in modernity? What has brought us to this terrible stance? I can answer in one sentence, because he judges us. People do not want to be judged. America, we, we have, um, we are living through a love cult. Everything is love. And uh, you see, even, even among many religious people, and, I, and they mean well, you will see billboards in America, God is love. And of course that's true. But today, we don't need the message, God is love. Today we need the message, God judges. God is a judge. That's powerful. God is love. For the average person in the West seeing the message, God is love, what they do is they invert it. Love is God. They have made love into God. But love is, is not lo like everything else. Love can be moral or immoral. Nazis loved their country. They did. They loved Germany. Nazis, that was their biggest love of all. You know how many people died at Stalin's funeral? You know how many Soviet citizens loved Stalin? You know that there are many Soviet citizens who love Stalin today. So it's love. I'm not, I'm not a love fan. I'm not, I admit it, I'm a goodness fan. I like goodness. Love is an emotion. Goodness is behavior. Now you could say love is behavior too, and that's fine. Anyway, that is the reason. They don't like, they don't want to be told. That is why they hate when I say, God says, do not murder. I don't need God to tell me. I am God. I will tell me. Man wanted to be God since the serpent in Genesis said, eat from the tree of knowledge. You, Adam and Eve, will be gods. Ooh, that sounds great. And then the Tower of Babel. They wanted to be gods. Let's make a big name for ourselves. We'll build a tower up to the heavens. Man has wanted to be God since the beginning. And our God doesn't allow that. Certainly. Uh, now, apart from that, uh, 
people, of course, hate not only uh, judgment. They keep, oh, that's so judgmental, Johnny. You don't have to judge me. And this Dennis Prager, we have to be honest, makes our preaching a bit, how should I say, uh, not so nice to people. People want to be entertained. People want to be told something that makes them feel good. And what we tell them, we conservatives, often right. put... So, so how can we make our conservative pill sweeter for the listener and for those who patiently should receive this medicine? That's a project. That, that I have to say, that is, that, is, that is what we all have to learn. First of all, you do it with a smile. God judges. <laughs> That's, you, 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 really, you, you do it with a smile, you do it with humor. You have to make people laugh. You have, you have to show that you're real. Religious people too often come across as not real. So you have to be real. You have to acknowledge that you're as interested in, in some of the things that they're as interested in. And, you know, my father was a very religious man. And he, we, we I came from an Orthodox Jewish home. And uh, every Friday night we had Shabbat, Sabbath dinner. Every Saturday afternoon we went Saturday to synagogue. I still do, still have Shabbat dinner. I still go to synagogue. And my father knew at the Friday night table, he could talk as long as he wants and his two sons will listen. Because the Friday night dinner was, there's no end to it. You just talk and talk. It's a very wonderful and healthy thing to have. My father spoke about sex. A man wearing a yarmulke. You know what a yarmulke is? The Jewish religious hat, okay? I think I have one on me. One second. Yes, this is to demonstrate. Show and tell, okay, this, okay? He wore it all the time. I keep it in my pocket. I am not as religious. So uh, anyway, he would, um, he would talk about sex as easily as he would talk about God or religion or his work or anything else. He was real. That, that was very persuasive to me. We too often in religious life don't come across as real. That doesn't mean we have to sink or lower our dignity. It just means we have to be real, just what it means. That's persuasive. You are entirely right. How to communicate the message is the, is the, is the great question. But in the final analysis, I tell people, you're interested in love, okay. You have a better chance of a loving world if people believe God said, love your neighbor as yourself, than if you don't. That's it, that's what I tell them, that's the truth. The odds are better that a person walking around thinking God commands love will do better than a person who doesn't think there is a God who commands love. Nature does not command love. Nature is morally useless. Where will you learn good and evil from if you have no God? From nature? From science? Science teaches nothing morally. There is no wisdom in science. Science is why I can walk. I love science. I've had surgeries that have enabled me to walk and conduct orchestras and not be paralyzed. I am indebted to modern science. But modern science or any science teaches you nothing about life, nothing. There is no wisdom in a test tube. That is in the Bible. And we are Bible-less. And so we have paid a price. All right, let me insist then. Because you spoke of wisdom and all ancient wisdom is telling us one thing, from the Ecclesiastes to the Stoics, to the Christian moral things, to medieval uh, nomic poetry. All ancient wisdom teaches one thing, and that is moderation. Modus in rebus, mede nagan. Now, modernity is entirely about excess, about being immoderate. How can we still make moderation 
appealing in a world of excesses and extremes and, and, and unbounded enjoyment and fulfillment and so on. And of course, that in a way continues the previous question. Get people who have ceased being drug addicts to speak to people. Get people who were uh, alcoholics to speak to people. Get people who were sex addicts to speak to people and tell them tell them how not controlling yourself ruins your life. I tell parents in America all the time, they, in America we had this unbelievably foolish idea, it originated in my state of California, called self-esteem. It's a big movement in America. So now in America, I wonder if you know this, <laughs> kids, children get trophies, awards, medals, just for playing. Do you understand what I said? Not for winning. I remember when my son's baseball team, which lost every game, it was the worst team in his league. He was about nine years old. And I went to him and I said, David, it was the last game of the year. Your team lost every game, but I see you have, you have a trophy. He said, yes. I said, what is it for? I had no idea. He said, for participation. <laughs> it's like for breathing. <laughs> you should get a trophy for breathing. I am happy and proud to tell you that my, that same son has an eight-year-old son who just got a participation trophy and gave it back. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I forgive me. So the end of the story is I tell parents, you will do a lot better if you teach your children self-control than self-esteem. That's the answer to that. You want a happy life? Control yourself. Life is a war between the mind and the brain. The more you listen to your brain or your heart, the worse you are. Who tells us not to listen to our heart? The Bible, right? It's the worst thing you could rely on is your heart. You have to rely on your mind, not your brain. Brain wants cheesecake. Mind doesn't want to be fat. Which do you listen to? That's the question in all of life. And yet everybody wants a trophy, everybody wants a cookie. And who are we to tell poor people that they are to be frustrated? Frustrated is another buzzword of, of the modern age. But the, the stumbling stone of the left and of what people call progressivism, and perhaps we should question that word as well, is equality. People don't want to make claims of superiority. They don't want some cultures to be regarded as better than others, some moral codes and moral systems as positively better than others, some people superior to others intellectually, uh, physically, or in whatever way. Uh, so equality is apparently, how can we explain to the people who think that conservative is mean and evil, you know, like, like that horrible Trump who is stopping all the world from moving to the United States. How can we explain to people that we are not against equality and how can we explain what equality really means? Well, we are, we're against equality of result. We're for equality of opportunity. We believe truly that all people are created in God's image and therefore we are obviously equal in worth. But the idea that cultures are equal, they, they, they don't even believe it themselves because they think that their culture of tolerance and no judgment is better than ours. So while they're saying no culture is better than any other, they believe their culture is better than every other. So they're lying to themselves, which is the most dangerous form of lie because you cannot do anything with someone who lies to himself. It, it, it's, it, it's astonishing that this now is popular. It is, it is a true danger to our civilization. If, if, it, there, was, there was a man who spoke, a, a left-wing clergyman, a rabbi in America, who spoke to 
the Islamic society of North America to a thousand Muslims and he said, I honor the veil. You know what the veil is? Is that clear to everybody where a woman covers her face? He honors the veil? Would he wear one? What do you mean you honor the veil? I, I don't honor the veil at all. It is demeaning. It is, it is dehumanizing. Not to be able to have one's face seen is dehumanizing. Period. End of issue. No man would allow it. He would feel disgraced if his, he had to cover his face. Why is it noble for a woman? This is what they have come to. They can't even judge that. So this is... Uh, you're right, they make us sound mean, but they, in the final analysis, are the mean ones. That's the irony. And this is, I, I point this out every day on my radio show. They are the mean ones. They went down, they're the ones, I mean, you know, there's so many examples. They went to Venezuela when Chavez was elected. Hollywood actors and Jesse Jackson, the so-called civil rights spokesman, they went down to Venezuela. They were so in love with Chavez because he said he was for equality. Look at Venezuela today. Middle class people are looking in garbage cans for food. They have ruined the richest country in Latin America because of equality. You know, you know better than any American audience what I'm talking about. Yeah, we came to understand that if you want to have equality in a society, the leveling can only be downwards, chopping heads, leveling everybody to the floor. And this is what communism has achieved by abolishing hierarchy, degree, as Shakespeare called it. Now, talking of communism, um, a very important Romanian philosopher and friend of ours, Horia Patapievich, who unfortunately is not here tonight, spoke about the... Uh, discord, the lack of unity in the European memory concerning the two terrible totalitarianisms of the 20th century. Whereas Nazi, uh, na National Socialism, Fascism is in a way present in the conscience of the West, communism is constantly tuned down. So whenever one of us goes West and talks to people there and, and explains his own experience, well, I was only 14 when intended, but other people spent their entire mature life in that horrible system. We are generally told either that it was a very good idea which was badly put into practice, or that we didn't quite get it, or in the worst of cases, which has happened to me quite often, that we are fascists. So how, what do you think? Of course, the reason is easy to explain, perhaps, but do you think there can be a unification in the Western awareness, conscience of the two terrible murders that happened in the 20th century. Again, I, just, I just want to let you know, there, I, I, I only do 10% of the PragerU videos, but one of those that I did is, why don't people, why doesn't communism have as bad a name as Nazism? And it's a very important thing because the day that people understand that communism was as evil as Nazism, hope, we will have hope for, for the future. But until then, you know, it, it, do you know that there, there is a restaurant in Los Angeles called the Mao Restaurant? Mao killed 60 million people. Now remember, 60 million that was killed. Think of all the people who suffered because of that death. It, what Mao did in the great leap forward, and do you know why he starved his people who then ate their children? You, you know why? To send food to Stalin who would give him weapons so he could be one of the strongest countries in the world militarily. He, he sacrificed 60 million of his people. I think it's 80 million. I'm giving you the low number. 60 million of his people so he could have more weapons. People, people don't understand what communism did. They don't understand what socialism does. Everybody thinks socialism, they don't think of what it did to, uh, to Venezuela. They think of, look at Norway. Norway is rich because it has North Sea oil. You know, it's also they're tiny countries. 
Sweden, by the way, Sweden has no... Sweden will stop being a Swedish country. The, am I doing something wrong? Well, you did something right. <laughs> Very good, thank you. Uh, this notion, everybody thinks uh, socialism, they don't think of all the socialist parties in Latin America that have ruined their countries. You know, by the way, <laughs> this was a great moment for me. I have learned so much from callers to my radio show. A young Venezuelan called me, because the show is heard on the internet, you know, all over the world. It's a wonderful thing. So a young Venezuelan calls my show, and he says, Dennis, I don't know, do you realize who the opposition to Maduro is? I said, no, I, I don't, tell me. He's also a socialist. And that opened my mind. The Venezuelan people don't blame socialism. They blame Maduro and Chavez. It's like the Soviets, they blamed Stalin, not communism. If it wouldn't have been Stalin, it would have been somebody else. Anyway, Lenin created the system. Lenin is the monster of the 20th century. But he is, he is, he is venerated in, in Russia to this day. Putin says the greatest tragedy of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. I bet you don't agree. Just a suspicion, just a suspicion. <laughs> All right, you blame very much on the colleges, and you are right to do so. Buckley also said that he would rather be ruled by the first 2,000 names in the, Har in the Boston telephone book than by the, uh, college, the staff of the University of Harvard. So that gives you, and of course, Alan Bloom said that all that the American University has achieved is the diversity of perversity. I like that phrase very much. So, uh, diversity of perversity. Do you think that we here in the East are as advanced as you are on the path to progress? Uh, and of course, progress must be between inverted quotes, commas. The, the hope for Europe is Eastern Europe. That's the, that's the, the only hope left. There is no hope in, in France, UK, or Spain, or any of them. There's, it's over for them. Maybe they'll awaken one day, that is possible. Maybe one day they'll awaken and realize, woo, we're, we're not Spain anymore, we're not England. And I'm not talking racially or ethnically, I couldn't care less about race and ethnicity. I only care about values. If, if every American were conservative and turned black tomorrow, I would be the happiest man in America. I couldn't care less about color. I care only about values. So, but you in Eastern Europe, because you, you, you were put to sleep for 40 years in effect, you couldn't, you couldn't go down, you couldn't decay like, like Western Europe could. It's a very odd thing, isn't it, that communism may have ended up saving Europe because Eastern Europe, having lived through that, is not as naive as Western Europe is. That's my hope. That is, that is my, my only hope, is that you will, will lead the way in Eastern Europe to a renaissance of Western civilization. You've, you still value it here. It is not valued. Do you know when President Trump went to Warsaw about uh, a year ago, and he said we have to work to preserve Western civilization? Do you know what the New York Times wrote? That he was he was really speaking about, uh, about um, white supremacy. Is that bizarre? He said that, you know, for example, we produce the symphony in the Western world. Now, so what did the New York Times classical music critic write? The president I don't know why the president picked on the symphony. Beethoven's third is no better than Indonesian gamelan music. Now, I found that fascinating because I know Beethoven's third. I don't know, admit it, I don't know Indonesian gamelan music. I then played it on my radio show. For most listeners, Beethoven's third won. But nevertheless, here's my question though. 
Who outside of Indonesia goes to a, a gamelan concert? But outside of the West, everybody goes to a Beethoven concert. Do you know who the greatest Bach interpreters in the world today are? Asians. Bach was German. It's a German Lutheran. Why are Japanese, the, the Japanese just recorded all of his hundreds and hundreds of cantatas. It is considered the finest version of the Bach cantatas recorded. It is done by a Japanese conductor and Japanese chorus and Japanese orchestra. They love Bach and Beethoven in Japan, but I could not see any advertisement in Japan for a gamelan music evening. I'm not against gamelan music. I happen to love indigenous music, but let's not, listen, I'm a Jew. Let me tell you something. There's no Jewish music that is as good as Beethoven's third. Okay, I admit it. It's not a problem. All very well. Now, Western Europe is not completely lost. Uh, in 2017, in October, um, there was a statement published in Paris by very many important European intellectuals, including um, Roger Scruton, uh, Pierre Manon, Remy Brague, uh, Richard Legutko, an important Polish uh, conservative thinker. And they wrote this manifesto for a Europe we can believe in, which actually argues exactly what you have been telling us tonight. And what they, they have a very nice phrase I remember there. They said, we are not, um, we don't lack values because we don't have them. We have become orphans by choice, orphans by choice. We have chosen to emasculate our culture. We have chosen to defile in that scatological poop uh, like way our high culture. We have chosen to ignore our decalogue. We have chosen to ignore our greatness. We have chosen to make claims of moral and cultural superiority. Now, do you think there can be a revival? Do you see such a thing in America after Trump's election? How do you value Trump's election and its impact on the world of conservative values and also on Europe? Do you think it will have an impact? Well, there are two issues. Trump is one, and, and the, the statement by the Europeans is another. It's so bad in Western Europe that the European Union created or wrote its charter about eight years ago or so. And you know what word was, did not once appear in the charter of the European Union? Christianity. Now, this is a Jew telling you this. If there, if there weren't Christianity, there would be no Europe. Christianity formed Europe. Whether you like it or don't like it, it's just a lie to omit Christianity in discussing what Europe is. That's how bad it is. They lie. That's, it's, that's a big, the dishonesty is a big part of it. Trump is an amazing phenomenon in a, in, in a nutshell. It is a, it's a phenomenon. I, I am, I, I'm almost tempted to say God had a hand in his election <laughs> because it's so unbelievable that it happened and it's so unbelievable how good he turned out. Now let me make it clear, he makes some very stupid comments, he makes wild comments, I wish he thought 10 times before every tweet, but okay, you know what, I wish many things. I wish cheesecake were not fattening. I have so many wishes you have no idea. All right, but I live in reality. If the price I have to pay to have defeated the left is a guy who tweets too much, I will live with it. I, you, you can check this out. I write for almost every conservative uh, website in the United States. Uh, my, my column is, is printed by, or published by them each week. And I wrote when he was running, I said, I am opposed to Donald Trump. I, any other Republican I can support. But I wrote this, if he is nominated, I will support him. Because defeating the left is the greatest good we can do in America today. And whoever can defeat the left is what I want. The left, everything the left touches, it ruins. The arts, religion, the Boy, the Boy Scouts in America are no longer the Boy Scouts 
because they now admit girls. So they're not even called Boy Scouts anymore. This happened last month. Everything the left touches, it ruins. Museums, as I said, religion, art, morality, anything. It's a nihilistic movement. So Donald Trump unbelievably won, unbelievably. By the way, I just want to tell you, the night of the election, I was sure he would lose. I was sure Hillary Clinton would win. And frankly, I thought that was the end for the United States in my lifetime. I really did. I, 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 I say this with sadness. But he won. You know what I did? My wife and I did not watch Fox News. We watched CNN and MSNBC. And I will tell you why. This is not noble. It does not speak well of me. Pure, 100% schadenfreude. The joy at others' suffering. We, we have something similar in Romania. It's called Antena 3. <laughs> You don't know that. Well, tell me about it. That's a Romanian joke. <laughs> yes. Now, of course, before coming here, someone who is also very interested in preaching to the youth asked me to ask you, how do you think we can address the millennials? And if you think that after all these uh, we call it sexo-Marxist, and that makes them terribly angry. Uh, uh, after this sexo-Marxist revolution, which started about 1968, do you think that there will be a reaction, and that the new generation, who often rejects the values of their parents' generation, will turn conservative, so that they end up voting for us, of course? This is what I now think on this issue. I think that if we reach them, we can change them, we can influence them. Not all of them, but at least half. I know this because of well, PragerU will have one billion views this year, one billion, and the majority are under 35 years of age. So we know what is happening. When I go to universities in the United States, I see that they are open. The problem is we have to reach them. They are, they will hear us, not all, but many will hear us, but we have to get the message to them. That's why I tell parents, I don't care if you pay your children to watch our videos, pay them. Anyway, I don't, I was a parent. I, I don't know how you can raise children without paying them to do things. I admit it, I was probably a terrible parent. I, uh, I bribed my kids for anything. Go to bed by nine o'clock, here's a dollar. <laughs> what do I find? Put on your pajamas, here's two dollars. You know. <laughs> but uh, I really, and there are parents who do, there are parents who tell me they give their kids five dollars every time they watch a video, which is a pretty good rate. Five dollars, that's, you know, that's very serious, that's serious money. That's 20 lei. You know, I mean, now I'm going to think of it in terms of Romanian money. So it's even more. But uh, I, I, you have, we have to reach them. They have to hear it. You know what I do it, uh, often when I go to universities in the United States? I begin with a big thank you. I say, I just want to thank you on behalf of my generation for your taking on all of our debts. That is so sweet of you. You are the most generous generation in American history. You will pay for everything my generation doesn't pay for. I, I can't thank you enough. And it starts to dawn on them, hey, wait a minute, why is that happening? Well, so socialism, do you know big government and socialism, I think, do you know the term Ponzi scheme is, yes. Every, what? What is it? Caritas? Oh, that's very funny. Okay. We'll explain it to you after. Yes, I, I got it, I got it already, yes. But anyway, it's all a Ponzi scheme. The next guy is paying, and if the next guy doesn't pay, it all falls apart. That's what's happening in Sweden. Sweden has to keep importing foreigners, so fewer and fewer of the people of Sweden are actually Swedish. 
So it has to bring in more people to support big government. Big government is a fraud. Aside from everything else, it doesn't work. It cannot work. It depends upon newer and newer blood, more people to pay in more money to support what they've already spent. And eventually it will, it will like uh, Bernie Madoff, it will burn out. And then I, 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 I fear what will happen at that point. All right, I, I can assure you that my son watches you without my paying him at all. That and is very impressive. Yeah, I actually, must say. I never paid him to do. I hope your son is not here because now he will ask you for money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dennis Prager himself said you should pay me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. T t don't put ideas into his head. But by mentioning children and well, without the uh, association to money, of course. It brings me to the topic of family. Now, the English used to say that charity begins at home. I think that sanity begins at home, so it doesn't start in college. I think it starts at home, much earlier than college, I'm afraid. And the question is, how can we keep the families sane? No, let's start by the beginning. How can we keep the families to begin with? Because nowadays, apparently, no one uh, still wants to get married. Of course, with the exception of the gay, they seem to be the only one who want to get married, but not men and women anymore, I'm afraid. So, in Romania, this is a topic of concern, and we have here a representative of the main center-right party who uh, knows that we have a referendum for uh, defining marriage in the traditional way and putting it in the Constitution. So, making a bill and this has been postponed for ages now, despite the fact that three million people have signed up for uh, calling this for this referendum. Do you think there is any chance of saving the family because the colleges supposedly can't be saved anymore, in well, America they, at least, or can they? Putting aside even the, the, the same-sex marriage issue, the left it admits much of the time they have no interest in preserving the family. I'll give you an example. In Canada, just last week, Canada is to the left of the United States under Trudeau. Canada last week, and even if Trudeau were not prime minister, this would have happened because this was a judge, not the prime minister, that d decided this. There is a, a, th a threesome. There are two men who love the same woman. And she loves those two men. They live together, they make love together, and they, she now gave birth to a baby. She wants all three to be listed as the baby's parents. The judge ruled that that is correct. And all mothers. I'm sorry? <laughs> and they want all of them to be called mother or father. <laughs> yes, I, I don't know what they'll be called, but I think you're right. So, in other words, they... It, the nuclear family, the notion of mother, father, and children as the ideal strikes the left as hateful. If you say that, if you think that is the ideal, you are not hate. Listen, my niece is, is a lesbian. My brother's daughter, I love her. She is married to a woman. I love the woman. I love their children. And they know I am against same-sex marriage. And they love Uncle Dennis to their credit. I admit it, but I do love them, and I want those children to grow up well. They're my, they're my niece's children. That's just a fact. So it has nothing to do with love or hate. It has to do with is there an ideal that society wants to foster? I don't know if this woman is here. I, 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 uh, she probably isn't, but I met a Romanian woman on the airplane coming in from London. And she was a wonderful young woman. I just enjoyed her immensely. And she was uh, with her three-month-old daughter. And she mentioned uh, that she's with her three-month-old daughter and her partner is in, in the other row. Not her husband, her partner. Now, this is a wonderful young woman doing a wonderful thing, having a child, caring for the child, I assume she loves her, her man, her man loves her. This is a beautiful thing, but they're not married because it doesn't matter anymore. 
this, the concept of marriage, and same in America. It, it, the, these are no longer values in, in our post-Judeo-Christian society. They're not values. And it's crumbling. So this, this is what we're up against. I, I have, uh, there was a man that I, <laughs> a man came over to me at a recent um, meeting for Prager University in America. And he said, let me ask you something. If I marry so-and-so, will you perform the wedding? I said, yes. He's been with her for six years and I have bothered him for six years. Will you please get married? She's a great woman. <laughs> You're a great guy, get married. So it worked. Men have to bother men. Do you know what is interesting? This is the most, you know what the most touching thing to me? I get a, a lot of compliments and a lot of insults. And uh, by the way, I have a very wonderful attitude that everyone should adopt. I do not let the compliments go to my head and I do not let the insults go to my heart. And it works. But the nicest thing or the most meaningful compliment is when a man calls my radio show, the man may be 50 and he may be 15, and says, you are a father figure to me, Dennis. And you know how I always respond? Every man should aspire to be a father figure to every young man. That is what is most desperately needed, men in boys' lives. All right, Be before it gets too wise, uh, we have to put an end to this, our dialogue, and to open the floor to the audience, which is not all boys, it's full of men who want to, uh, and women as well. Yes, indeed, I was going to admit that. And we would like to take how many questions? Three, three questions. So whoever wants to, please. Is, is there a roving microphone? Is no, there, no, or, it's or? okay. Can I call you Dennis? Yeah. We're, yeah, please, of course. Good, thank you. Romania is a very traditional country. Romania will preserve the marriage, and women and men will get married and will give birth to children. Romania is a very religious country, so welcome to a very religious country. It's exceptional that you do this thing, what you do. We, many of us here, consider that we continue in Romania a neo-socialism system, which we don't like. We look to US, we look to Europe, because those are democratic societies. So for us, on one hand, you say we are the hope. On the other hand, we want to get rid of what is the old regime, which is corrupt, which is stealing our money from the budget. We have an issue on this one quite, quite now. And the question is, how do you want to combine our wish to get rid of this past? And we, we fight among us because, as Mr. Papa Haji said, we don't like Antenna 3. We look to other TV stations. And how do you want us to get together, to fight together, to promote God, and not look to Western Europe or US when we look to them? And how to combine the two tendencies? We want to look to them, we would like to be like them, but still we would like to keep our traditional religious well, society. The truth is we may end up looking to you uh, maybe you should start thinking that way. It's a wonderful thing to think that you might be a light to the world. I love America very deeply, I really do. I love my country. But I am not naive about what is happening to my country. 
There are things to look to to America, but there are things not to look to America. There are things that are better here. But corruption will eat your society. Corrupt, I, I, you have my book, I, I just found out it's my, just on the Ten Commandments is in, is in Romanian. My dream is that my Bible commentary comes in Romanian. But in the meantime, I hope you will read it in English, the, the rational Bible. And when I, I have a much, much longer description of the Ten Commandments in that book. It's 20,000 words just on the Ten Commandments. My argument is that the most important of the Ten Commandments is do not steal. Because everything else is a function of stealing. Murder is stealing a life. A lying in court is stealing justice. Adultery is stealing a spouse. Everything is about stealing. The reason that countries do not advance, the single biggest reason is corruption. I have been to 20 African countries. I have tremendous admiration for Africans. If you go to Africa, you will fall in love with a lot of Africans. They are industrious, they are bright, they are hardworking, they are serious, but they can get nowhere because their societies are almost all corrupt. You can't advance in a corrupt society. And do you know what fosters corruption? Big government. Period. It is not possible to have big government and little corruption. You would have to change human nature. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. That is not from me. It's from a man named Lord Acton. The, the left is corrupt definitionally because it advocates that which creates corruption, big government. The, the tragedy is that by, through big government, they make promises. This is what we will give you. And please understand, this is one of the most painful insights. People prefer to be taken care of more than they want liberty. Liberty is a value, not an instinct. So this, this is, you have to start a different mindset. Maybe Romania will be a model. Forget looking to Western Europe. Forget even looking to America. I wish, I wish you could look to America. There was a time when you could. America is in terrible crisis. America wants to be Europe. You all heard of Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. They were, they believed in God, but they did not believe in Christianity as such. Okay, just want to make that clear. But they loved the Bible. They made a design for the seal of the United States of America. You could see it on the internet. And what was it? The Jews leaving Egypt. Because they said, just as the Jews left Egypt, we Americans left Europe. And you know what is happening? Today, the left wants to bring America back to Europe. It is like the Israelites who wanted to go back to Egypt. Maybe you will be the model. You have to have that mindset. You know the famous line, from Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of God from Jerusalem? Maybe the word of God will come from Bucharest. Maybe it will, God willing. Yeah. A second question then. There is a big difference between the United States and Europe. Uh, the United States had stronger Christian values uh, at the beginning of the last century. What was the greatest mistake that made the things to go down so rapidly? Uh, and what would you think that would be the number one mistake of the Christians in politics, the conservatives in the United States, that they lost the battle in, in such uh, a, a, a rampant way. Right. And also, how would that would apply to Romania? Because very few Christians would go into politics. Uh, they stay away. They, are, they actually despise politics. Mm -hmm. So what can we learn from the United States mistakes? Thank you. Uh, so those are great questions, and there's more than one, and that's fine. Uh, let's start with the last one. Uh, Christians have to make a decision uh, does God care about this world or not? It's a tension in Christianity. But uh, God made this world, so he wants us to make it a good world. I mean, it, why would he make this world if he didn't care about it? 
A Christian who doesn't care about this world isn't doing God's work. If the world were beautiful, you could retreat to a monastery, but it's not beautiful. And that's why I said, those of you who love God must hate evil. That's, that's in the, the Bible. I didn't make that line up. That's from the Bible. Christians have to become involved. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a, I think it's a divine imperative that they become involved. It's the same problem in America. A lot of them just stay home and they're, you know, they're going to do God's work. They'll pray. They'll go to church. In the meantime, their society is falling apart. I don't know. That's not Christian. It's not Jewish. It's not Christian. Where did, where did they go? Where did we go wrong? It's a, uh, here is my, my belief. <laughs> this is going to. Uh, it started in the late 19th century when Americans went to Germany to get doctorates. American universities did not offer PhDs, so they went to Germany. And they didn't know Prager's rule. The Germans are always wrong. <laughs> it, it is, by the way, it's, I have to say something. I have to make something clear. They are always wrong, but... There are many wonderful Germans. Yeah. Two, two of the most wonderful human beings in my life happen to be German by sheer coincidence. There are spectacular Germans. Needless to say, in music, if it weren't for Germany, I would be depressed. What would I do without Bach, Beethoven, Schubert, Schumann, uh, Telemann, I mean, er, basically everybody, okay? Who's left? Tchaikovsky and Anescu, which is nice, but not quite Bach and Beethoven, let's be honest. Okay. By the way, I do like Inescu, just, just for the record, I want you to know. And not just the, uh, not just the Romanian Rhapsodies, he's, he, the symphonies, he's, he's a genius. Anyway, um, this is, uh, the, the Germans gave the Americans their first PhDs. And by the way, that's where socialism began, was in Bismarck's Germany. They just, they just filled with bad ideas, I don't know why. It's, it's, it's very strange, it, but it's true. And so gradually these, this, these notions of socialism and secularism rose in, in the acad academic world. They raise generations to think if you are sophisticated, you are secular. If you are so, you're sophisticated, you're socialist. To the point that according to a Pew, the most sophisticated polling in America, more than half of American millennials think that capitalism is bad. The only system to ever take people out of poverty is bad. That is the only ism to take people out of poverty has been capitalism, and they think it is bad. It shows they don't care about people, they care about ideas. So all of this created the crisis that we have today, and uh, we have, we, the, the, finally, the answer is, and this is the other final, my final word on this, good people have to fight. Most good people don't fight. This is a problem. It's a very big problem. And in the meantime, we have the left and the Germans taking care of Europe, which is two very bad things. All right, one last question, or is the... Oh, it's yours. I, I, I'm afraid that we don't have time for another question because we have to vacate the uh, building. Uh, but Signing. thank you very much, and uh, let's uh, all give a... Thank you all. Prayer. God bless you. Thank you. Mr. Prager.